Good evening, Bumblebee folks. I'm Alexa, the resident emo girl, and I'm so happy to be back here today. Traditions are always something neat to talk about, since they can range from mundane things like carving a pumpkin for Halloween to spitting over a shoulder before a show, or you know, who even knows. Feel free to let me know what traditions you observe in the comments, because I'm always super curious. I know one of mine now is that every year when my roommate and I put up our Christmas tree, we always, always, always watch our favorite nostalgic Christmas movies while we're doing it. But while that's just, you know, cutesy, here are the top 10 most peculiar traditions of the Victorian era. In 10th place, we have deadly party games. So back in the day, board games weren't the massive industry they are today, and Victorians loved their parlor games, even more so when they risked their lives doing it. Because you know, why not? One such game was called Snapdragon and involved pouring raisins into a bowl, soaking them in rum, and setting them on fire before scrambling to remove as many raisins as possible and chomp them down while they were still aflame. Because you know, why not? Another game was called Hot Cockles, and I couldn't make all of this up if I tried. Blindfolded and with your head in someone's lap, partygoers would take turns kicking you in the rear end, and then you uh, had to guess who it was that kicked you. This sounds not only uncomfortable from the start, but like it could quickly get out of hand, and my tailbone hurts thinking about it. Yet another game was called Cellar Stairs, and involved walking backwards down a flight of stairs using a handheld mirror as your only guide. Supposedly the features of your future mate would appear in the mirror, but it seems more likely that you would just, you know, fall down the stairs, and I know I would have. My balance is not the best. Finally, there's the Candle and Apple game, sometimes called Snap Apple. The game was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries that Halloween was often referred to as Snap Apple Night. Candles and apples would be hung from the ceiling, and the goal is to get a bite of the apple without consuming any wax or getting burned. As a former altar girl who used to play with wax, youch! I can't imagine just how much that would hurt my face. Also, I think I found where uh, Ready or Not got its inspiration. In ninth place, we have hats made from taxidermy birds. Not gonna lie, I'm not the biggest fan of taxidermy, even though I have a friend who has a museum in his home that has more than a few pieces. Granted, he mostly focuses on albino taxidermy. But hey. To each their own. What began as a few plumes from herons, jays, and you know pheasants tucked into the brims of headwear became a wildly popular trend, which the fashion industry capitalized on by going to the extreme, adding entire taxidermy birds to very tall hats, as well as stuffed hummingbirds to decorative hand fans. According to the Victorianist, millinery fashion took a truly bizarre turn in the 1880s, when hat crowns grew tall, offering a generous display area for, in the most extreme examples, an extraordinary array of animals, including cats and squirrels. I I don't even want to imagine the amount of flies that would be circling, you know, around hats that was still a trend in today's world. How warm things are thanks to global warming. Also, I rave for neck health since I doubt those hats were very light, and as someone who has worn a couple of very heavy wigs in my lifetime, they tend to take a toll. In eighth place, we have Victorian death photographs. So photographs of loved ones taken after they died may seem kind of morbid by today's standards, but in Victorian England, they were a way of commemorating the dead and blunting the sharpness of grief. Remember. Unless you were rich enough to have a painting commissioned, there really wasn't a way to preserve visual proof that someone existed and how they looked for future generations. In images that are both unsettling and strangely, you know, fitting, families poised with the dead and consumptive young ladies elegantly recline. The disease not only taking their life, but you know, increasing their beauty. Victorian life was full of death. Epidemics such as diphtheria, typhus, and cholera scarred the country, and from 1861 onwards, the bereaved queen made mourning fashionable. Trinkets of memento mori, meaning remember you must die, took several forms and existed long before Victorian times. Long exposures when taking photographs meant that the dead were often seen more sharply than the slightly burned living, because of their lack of movement. On some occasions, eyes would be painted onto the photograph after it was developed, which was meant to make the deceased more lifelike, while other times death was a lot more obvious. Locks of hair cut from the dead were arranged and worn in lockets and rings. Death masks were created in wax, and the images and symbols of death appeared in paintings and sculptures. But in the mid-1800s, photography was becoming increasingly popular and affordable, leading to memento mori photographic portraiture. Try saying that five times fast. The first successful form of photography, the daguerreotype, was an expensive luxury, but not nearly as costly as having a portrait painted, which, like I said before, that was the only way you could do it first. As the number of photographers increased, the cost of daguerreotypes fell. Less costly procedures were introduced in the 1850s, such as using thin metal, glass, or paper rather than silver. Pricey, pricey silver. In seventh place, we have uses for arsenic. Pardon me, uses other than ending lives. But you know, that also makes me want to consider a top 10 creative ways to dispose of people. Martha Ponder. Arsenic invaded almost every aspect of life in 19th century Britain, leaving a toll of death and illness. A byproduct of an emerging smelting industry, arsenic was cheap and readily available as rat killer by uh, the early 1800s. It was also odorless and tasteless, and easily confused with flour or sugar or other cooking essentials. By the mid 
1930s, morbid descriptions of death from arsenic terrified the public and became a staple of the British popular press. But most of the fatalities from arsenic were more pedestrian. From accidental use in food or from exposure to arsenical compounds in consumer goods such as fabric dyes and wallpapers, in facilities that made these products, and in the polluted air. Arsenic was used even in medications to treat everything from asthma and cancer to reduce libido and skin problems. Now, Victorians were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are, if not more dangerously. Many women used arsenic to fight wrinkles, and men swallowed arsenic tablets as kind of a pre-Pfizer Viagra. It's unclear if arsenic can actually be used to um, turn compasses to true north, but it doesn't seem advisable to try it. I feel like there are much safer ways to get a uh, motor running, if you will. In sixth place, we have wasp wastes. We all know that corsets were a thing in the Victorian era, but they were much more extreme than most people might think. Many women cinched themselves down until they had very tiny wasp waists. With super snug corsets that didn't just rearrange your insides, they made it impossible to breathe. Now, before anyone starts calling all corsets or stays awful to wear, they're only bad for your health if you're trying to accomplish the above improperly. As a gal who corsets often for fashion and posture purposes, I've only ever experienced discomfort when they weren't properly fitted, like when, or when I was wearing them for too long, or when I was wearing the combination of a too small steel boned one outdoors in the cold for too long. But this is a do as I say and not as I do kind of situation, since that was like a one time thing and my ribs have very much learned their lesson. Long story short, corsets are not bad, you just have to wear them properly. You trust me, right? In fifth place, we have grave robbing. Now, my first thought when I said that just now was Grave Robber the character, which only goes to show how much Repo the Genetic Opera has rotted in my brain. One of the most lucrative side hustles of the Victorian era was grave robbing. And the fresher the corpse, the better. Medical students needed cadavers to study, so a black market of corpses arose, enriching adventurous thieves and uh, angering families of the dearly departed. The 19th century was also a fertile age of exploration. One of the most impressive discoveries were ancient mummies that the people of Victorian England brought home from Egyptian vacations. They'd invite all of their friends over for unwrapping parties, which tended to be rather grim spectacles, that nevertheless delighted the morbid weirdos. Look, while I don't condone it, I wouldn't mind time traveling back to be a fly on the wall at those parties, since I I definitely classify myself as a morbid weirdo. At one notable gathering for the unwrapping of Nescons, the second wife of Theban high priest Pinogem II was placed in a contraption that made her appear to dance. The demand for mummies to take home was so high that Egyptians started transporting them from less visited ruins to areas that had a lot more traffic. Hey, whatever helps the economy. In fourth place, we have garden hermits. So the next time somebody shows off their garden to you, make sure to ask where they keep their hermit. And if they don't have one, make sure to comment on how undignified it is. In the Victorian era, wealthy families hired people to don full hermit garb, complete with robes, long hair, beards, and hermit glasses, and live as an ornamental garden hermit on their land. The biggest rule of all though? No speaking to anyone on the property. And honestly, sounds like a dream job to me. Ugh, being paid in house to not speak to anyone and just be like a silly little decoration feature? Sounds like upgraded background work, and I will totally take it. Granted, that's if someone wants like a spooky ooky gothic garden feature. I'm all yours. In third place, we have shock treatment. No, I'm not talking about the cursed as all get out sequel to Rocky Horror, but more people should be. I've only watched it once, but it does have some bops for sure. In the 19th century, Victorians thought electrotherapy could fix everything from gout to muscle problems. All you had to do was pay your local electrotherapist who shocked the problem area, but really all it did was leave a lot of people with icky scars. In more modern times though, it has been refined to work well for muscle issues, but it uh, wasn't always that way. In second place, we have weird face masks. Patented in 1875, Madame Raleigh's face mask was strapped to a woman's head overnight, three nights per week. That was how you do it, you followed the rules. Made of flexible India rubber, the mask could be filled with unguents and all manners of salves and bleaches to uh, treat the skin. However, the mask did have a second purpose, which was to make the face sweat all night long. Also called the face glove, the device would excite perspiration with a view to soften and clarify the skin by relieving the pores and the superficial circulation. Inventor Helen Raleigh claimed the mask could be used by persons suffering with certain forms of disease or afflicted with a bad complexion, which came in the form of cutaneous eruptions, blotches, pimples, freckles, or fugitive discolorations, and for clocked pores and capillary congestion. So, a uh, cure-all? Now, this mask became very, very popular and uh, led to some market competition. One improved overnight mask was made of flannel, while another complained that existing masks didn't allow for poisonous gases to escape, so she proposed layers of chamois and satin. And hey, if all else failed, Victorian women layered raw beef or veal over their faces before bed. I love a good face mask as much as the next person, but um, I think I'll stick with what I already know. In first place, we have corpse medicine. The Victorian era ushered in the tail end of 
corpse medicine, which was the practice of ingesting different parts of the human body to cure various ailments. One popular drink to cure apoplexy mixed powdered human skull and chocolate, while the most coveted remedy mixed skull with uh, booze to each their own. By the 19th century, most doctors had uh, moved away from this barbarous practice, but medical texts and cookbooks that explained you know how to best repair a body part suggested that it was far from uh, dead. To get fresh supplies, people often went to an executioner rather than a pharmacist, paying good money for the freshest of fresh products as recommended by a doctor that was shockingly not accused of being a vampire. I even found a recipe for uh, red fluid marmalade. And that brings us to the end of our list, and uh, people really used to do the craziest things. I'll stick to my modern traditions that are a little less uh, life threatening. Feel free to leave this video a like if you had a good laugh or gasp, subscribe and hit the bell while you're at it, and I'll see y'all next time I buzz in over here at Bumblebee.